Thank you everyone for coming along this evening. I realize it's a bit of a dodgy evening, especially for Perslings, and you could be at home enjoying yourselves, but instead you came up to a book launch. Um, so thank you very much for coming along, I really appreciate it. Uh, when I mentioned the title, Why Mindfulness is Better Than Chocolate, um, I, I deliberately picked the title because I wanted something a little bit uh, provocative, a little bit in your face. Um, and of course I, cho I chose a, a subject, chocolate, or a, a, content, a thing, uh, which is universally you know, loved. But what I hadn't counted on is just how vehemently, how passionately people love chocolate. Because the last couple of weeks since this book came out, I've had so many messages, emails, Facebook messages, LinkedIn messages saying, you know, the title by my friends is better than chocolate, ha ha, very good, but it's just not true. You know, people, people are really quite uh, aggressive about it. Um, and uh, the reality is, um, there is actually, apart from wanting to attract people's attention to, and I find, frankly, many of the titles on mindfulness and meditation are terribly dull and worthy and boring, um, so I wanted something a little bit fun. Um, but the fact is, there is actually scientific evidence that mindfulness is better than chocolate. Um, there is a study done by the psychology department at Harvard a couple of years ago, um, and it involved 2,000 people who had smartphones. And they were sent these three questions at different times of the day and night. Uh, the three questions were, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And how happy are you? And what the survey found, interestingly enough, was that about 47% of the time, people are not thinking about what they're doing. We're thinking about something else. Uh, and the other interesting fact was that there is a direct correlation between thinking about what you're doing and self-reported levels of happiness. And it doesn't seem to matter what you're doing, whether you're eating the most delicious, mouth-watering Belgian praline chocolate, or washing the dishes, you're just as likely to have a wandering mind. Hence the sort of scientific underpinnings of this title that mindfulness really does trump chocolate when it comes to delivering on happiness. And the conclusion of the study published by, as I say, uh, the Harvard Psych Department in Science Magazine, was that the human mind is a wandering mind, and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And the ability to think about what is not happening is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. A cognitive achievement, but an emotional cost, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, in fact, there's, uh, there's only one area of human activity uh, in which mindfulness is reported to be very, very high. I'm sure you can all guess what it is. <laughs> only 10% of people reported having wandering minds while having sex. And I'm kind of curious to know, what were those 10% of people thinking? <laughs> Are there any common themes? You know, is it true about grocery lists? I think we need to have more research on this subject. Interestingly enough, I, I'd chosen this, this title, and I came home from the gym one day feeling all kind of pumped up with endorphins. Um, and I said to Koala, my wife, she was sitting at the, uh, tapping away in a uh, laptop, and I said, I've had a great idea, a better idea than why mindfulness is better than chocolate. I should make it why mindfulness is better than sex. And she looked up at me and said, um, I thought your readership was middle-aged women. And I said, well, generally it is. And she said, stick to the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the background to the title. And you might be asking, in this wonderful bookstore that we have uh, here and elsewhere, there are so many uh, mindfulness and meditation titles. Why does the world actually need another book on mindfulness? Um, well, I actually feel uh, quite strongly that it does for a number of reasons. The main one being that, just to give you an example, a, a few months ago, I was doing a mindfulness seminar at the UWA AIM Extension Business School. And uh, we had quite an interesting session, and there were a whole lot of engineers in this particular group. And one of them said to me, tell me, David, I've just been up in Thailand, and we saw a whole lot of Buddhist monks there. And the Buddhist monks seem to have a pretty easy life. They basically emerge from their monastery in the mid-morning. They get fed generous quantities of food by the local community for their lunch. And then in the afternoons, they sort of don't do terribly much. And then they go back to the monastery to sleep it all off. And that's the pattern of their lives. And they have zero stress. Why on earth do they need to meditate? And he was sort of smiled rather challenged. Like, I've got him on this one. You know, how is he going to come back from this? And a lot of his uh, friends were sort of nodding and smiling, thinking, yeah, we've got this guy now. And to me, it just showed what a tragically diminished idea of meditation and mindfulness people have. I mean, it's great that people are aware that meditation is good for stress. But of course, it goes far, far beyond that. Uh, stress management is not an important reason. It's certainly not the main reason why Buddhists meditate. 
and it's certainly not the reason why meditation was developed all those thousands of years ago. And I feel very strongly that many of the mindfulness books that we see on the shelves these days don't actually address that root point. They will talk about, they, they give you Mac mindfulness, if you like, mindfulness light, whatever you want to call it. It's basically just skimming the surface. And while there are many, many benefits from practicing meditation and mindfulness, um, you know, with a very superficial expectation, the true value of mindfulness goes a lot deeper. Having said that, it's important to reach out to people where they are. So in this book, my new book, um, what I've tried to do is to do exactly that. In the first third of the book, we talk about things like stress management and all the many, many physical and psychological benefits of meditation and mindfulness. And I'll just rattle through a few of these because it really is, uh, these are all proven by very recent clinical studies which I've summarized in the front of the book. So meditation reduces stress, it lowers high blood pressure and helps treat heart disease. It boosts immunity, slows aging, reduces health costs, helps manage chronic pain, reduces mortality, helps people suffering from chronic inflammatory conditions, it lessens the likelihood of recurring depression, it helps manage and prevent anxiety, reduces feel feelings of loneliness, promotes good sleep, enhances mental clarity, enhances emotional resilience, increases self-compassion, helps break tough habits, makes music sound better, it improves our working memory and academic performance, and it rewires the brain for happiness. And that's, I think, a very impressive list of benefits, and it's well worth getting out of bed 10 minutes every morning just for that alone. But that's only the start of the meditation and mindfulness journey. That's really at the, the you know, the base, base camp, if you like, of the Himalayas. Um, but it, things get far more interesting as we evolve in our meditation journey. And of late, um, mindfulness has been increasingly used by cognitive behavior therapists. And I'm sure many of you are aware of CBT. Can I have a show of hands, people who know what CBT is, cognitive behavior therapy? Quite a lot. So, I mean, the, the basis of cognitive behavior therapy is that it, we don't really respond to um, the things in the outside world. They don't cause us to feel happy or unhappy. It's our interpretations of those events which make us feel happy or unhappy. And so the objective is to try and identify what those unhappiness causing interpretations and beliefs and attitudes are and to try and transform them. We can only do that, however, if we know what's going on inside our own minds. You can't manage what you don't monitor. So first we need to monitor, and that is the whole purpose of mindfulness. And so recently it's been shown that uh, the, the practice of mindfulness in conjunction with cognitive behavior training can really uh, turbocharge our ability to transform our own em emotional and, and mental well-being. It really is quite liberating when you discover that every thought we've ever had is temporary. It arises, abides, and dissolves. It's not there all the time. And the only reason that, that these thoughts keep on re recurring is if we empower them with our attention. If we withdraw our attention from thoughts, they have no, they have no capacity to, to remain there. They can't come back. They're not going to return. And it's us who, is in our, who, are, who are in the driving seat. And that really can be quite an amazingly empowering discovery when we know that instead of being the victims of our thoughts, we can actually become their observers. And we can rob thoughts of their power to make us feel make us feel unhappy. So the second part of the book is all about how mindfulness and meditation can help us take charge of our own emotional destiny, our own emotional uh, mental trajectory, and how what a powerful and amazingly wonderful tool this is for our well-being. But the last third of the book is really where it gets terribly exciting to me. And this is all about the true and original purpose of meditation and mindfulness. And that is to understand and to experience the nature of our own minds directly, non-conceptually for ourselves. Some people get a bit confused, what do you mean by non-conceptually? Well, I always, used to I always liked a little uh, example. When a, s a couple of years ago, I was watching this TV show about cocoa plantation workers in Africa. It wasn't a promising subject, and I was about to turn over the TV. Um, but what made it interesting was that all these cocoa plantation workers had for many, many years been working on these great big estates, picking little bits of brown co uh, cocoa beans, putting them in hessian sacks and loading them off to the, uh, to the coast where they got sent off to the chocolate factories. And they all had a good idea of chocolate. They knew that chocolate was sweet, that it came in a variety of flavors, that it was wrapped in foil, that it, um, it was brown and you bit into it, it was hard, but it melted in your mouth. They knew all of that stuff, but none of them had actually ever eaten chocolate. And what made the documentary interesting was that the people had actually wore chocolate with them. And it was really wonderful to watch these guys for the very first time unpeeling their very first real bar of chocolate and putting it in their mouths and having a bite. And you can just imagine their faces just transformed 
as they had their first real life bite of chocolate. And that's the same with meditation. Meditation gives us exactly the same opportunity to experience directly and firsthand the nature of our own mind. And that's an amazing thing because most of the time our mind is completely obscured by the agitation and dullness that perpetuates the whole time. But when we have the ability um, to actually identify and to observe our own mind directly and firsthand for ourselves, we have our own first bite. You know, we can start to see at the very first time the nature of our own mind. And the, the amazing thing is that we discover that our mind has all sorts of qualities that we may not have imagined that it did. It's not some dull void of any thought. It actually uh, has the most astonishing capacity um, for, for, for feeling. And in fact, the, our mind is as much a feeling as it is a cognition. And that feeling is one of, of great contentment and well-being and tranquility, if only we can experience it, which we do uh, initially in small pieces. <coughs> but rather than me ramble on on that subject, what I wanted to do, just to sort of close this very uh, short uh, presentation, I'd like to just read a few paragraphs uh, from the new book, uh, which sort of summarizes what I've been getting at. Excuse me while I crack out my glasses. You tell you're getting old. Okay. So um, this is on page 12. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm basically in this first chapter, what I've tried to do is give a bit of an overview of the book. Okay, so, and then we come to mind itself, what it is, what it is not. I'll guide you through the practical steps by which you can experience your own mind for yourself, not as a concept or intellectual idea, but directly and firsthand. You will be empowered to experience the nature of your own consciousness, and if you're anything like most people who've never tried this before, you'll find in those first glimpses of the pure nature of your own mind an extraordinary truth. You'll see for yourself how your mind is quite literally infinite, how it has no beginning and no end how far from being some existential void, it's imbued with the most profound, happiness-giving qualities. You'll experience the paradox that even though you set out to explore your mind, the result is as much a feeling as it is a perception. It's an experience beyond concept, and for which words are therefore wholly inadequate, but that may be hinted at using terms such as oceanic tranquility and radiant love. Even the briefest encounter with the state is life-changing, because when we can free ourselves from the agitation or dullness that pervades our minds and encounter our own true natures, if only momentarily, we can never go back to believing ourselves to be nothing more than a bag of bones. We have experienced a dimension of being that transcends all our usual ideas of self. We have come home. So um, I'd like to leave things there, and I, I really hope that in writing this book, my heartfelt wish that as many of you as possible can experience for your own selves, for yourselves, uh, the nature of your own minds, because to me that is, it's been a re remarkable journey of transformation for me personally, and I have no doubt at all that, that each of you, in whatever way you most need, will benefit uh, tremendously through the practice of meditation and mindfulness. And the most amazing discovery that at your own heart, right here, you find that your own true nature is nothing other than pure great love, pure great compassion. It's an extraordinary discovery to make. But just before we end, I just want to say a few thank yous because tonight isn't much about thank yous as anything else. And first of all, thank you to Karen for, first of all, for hosting this evening, um, but also for setting up the Bodhi Tree, which is a unique venue in Perth. There's nowhere else anything like it, nowhere else in Perth that you know, can even begin to compare with this place. Even in other, other cities, I don't think we have, you know, there's nowhere like this in Sydney or Melbourne that I'm aware of, even remotely. I mean, it really is an amazing place, uh, not just in Perth, but the whole of the country, and possibly even much, much wider than that. So thank you, Cara, for all you've done, because it's an amazing venue. I'd also like to thank uh, everyone who's helped me write this book. Um, there have been so many people who've directly or indirectly been involved, um, uh, including the people who've actually read the manuscript, and we've got a couple here. Susan, thank you very much. Koala, my wife, who always reads the first draft of everything and Graham, who's busy here taking uh, lots of videos. Um, thank you so much for all that you've done. And uh, of course, I must acknowledge uh, from my heart the, the leadership and all the teachings shown and given to me by Les Shea, who's our teacher up at the Tibetan Buddhist Society. And if none of you have, or if you haven't had the benefit of one of his teachings, I'd highly recommend you come up the hill one day, Tibetan Buddhist Society, and hear him because he's a remarkably inspirational teacher. 
And if you want more information on that, just go to tibetanbuddhistsociety.com.au. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming on this evening, uh, making it through the rather dodgy weather. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. I really appreciate it. And uh, of course, special thanks to my wife, who's always been there, wonderful support. I love you, Kawara. Thank you so much. Thank you.